is Jesus Christ? For nearly 2,000 years, theologians, philosophers, and scientists have sought to answer this question. From the prophetic visions of the Hebrew prophets, to the eyewitness testimony of Jesus' disciples, even to the rhetoric of Greek philosophers, Jesus is an enigma, difficult to understand or reason based upon human logic and debate. So much fear, so many disputes, so much blood being spilled over the centuries because of theories concerning the person of Jesus Christ. It's amazing how much controversy and confusion can be caused by this one itinerant preacher from Nazareth. Recently, the secular media worked tirelessly to confuse and discredit the historical concept of Jesus Christ. We saw the Da Vinci Code book and movie become international sensations. We saw the resurgence of the highly controversial book known as Holy Blood, Holy Grail. We also witnessed the secular media and academia rave about the controversial Gospel of Judas that was produced as a historical documentary concerning the life of Jesus. The most recent assault upon the historical concept of Jesus came from the movie producer James Cameron and Simka Hakobovich, the controversial documentary director and producer entitled The Lost Tomb of Jesus. All of these books, movies, and television documentaries are designed to do only one thing. They seek to confuse and cloud the true history of Jesus Christ presented in the Bible. Let's allow the Bible and the Holy Spirit to speak in defense of the historical Jesus Christ. This series is designed to take the pictures of Jesus Christ presented in the four Gospels and harmonize these narratives into one panoramic picture of his life. Jesus Christ was a real person who lived and breathed and walked on the cobblestone streets of ancient Jerusalem. He taught on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and preached in the cities, towns, and countrysides of a small country roughly the size of the state of New Jersey known as Palestine or Israel. The goal of the coming episodes is to put Jesus into the historical, cultural, and geographical arenas that impacted his life and ministry. Over the centuries, the Gospels have been studied from many viewpoints. They've been analyzed and scrutinized, with thousands of books written concerning Jesus Christ. Each sought to answer the question, Who is Jesus Christ? This is the same question we all must answer. Even with all of this, surprising little attention has been given to the person of Christ as revealed in the Gospels. Much has been written in the name of truth concerning Christ. We naturally assume doctrine about Christ is truth, but is this the case presented by the New Testament? The New Testament teaches that truth is not theological doctrine concerning Christ. Truth is Christ. According to John chapter 14 verse 6 and Ephesians chapter 4 verse 21, truth is the person of Christ. Let's never forget this point because only when the Spirit of Christ is released has real biblical truth been ministered. Sound doctrine finds its source in truth. While man may teach and communicate sound biblical doctrine, but only the Holy Spirit can reveal truth. The reality of Christ can only be understood through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of Jesus was different from any other teacher in history. He called attention to his person rather than his doctrine. In order for us to effectively study the life of Christ, we must direct our attention primarily to the person as well as the purpose of Christ's earthly ministry. The life of Jesus did not begin, as does the life of all other persons, at the moment of birth. He came into the world from a pre-existent state to fulfill a specific mission. 
This great truth is clearly revealed in John's prologue to his gospel. In this brief introduction, John stated certain facts concerning Christ and his mission. Let's extract from this prologue insight into the person and mission of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 1, there are three phrases recorded concerning the nature of Christ. Let's examine each phrase. The first phrase teaches that the Word is preexistent with God, who was the source and organizer of the universe. In the second phrase, John clearly revealed that the Word is with God. The Greek word pros, that is translated by the English word with, does not denote being near or beside, but it denotes a living union and communion, implying the active notion of intercourse. Thus John's statement is that the divine Word not only abode with the Father from all eternity, but the Word was living in communion with Him. In the last phrase, John stated that the Word is God. In this verse, he used the Greek word logos to communicate that Jesus is the eternal Word of God. John clearly affirmed that Jesus is the logos who is God. According to Jewish and early Christian tradition, logos is comprised of two natures, thought and the communication of that thought. How often do we read the Bible and miss the Spirit of the Word? Only by perceiving the Spirit of the Word do we experience the power of Logos. The author of the book of Hebrews also confirmed this point. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 Who being the brightness of His glory and the expressed image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Here is the same verse presented by the Amplified Bible. He is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light beam, the outreign of the divine, and he is the perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature. Christ is the brightness and the radiance of God's glory, not the reflection. He is the expressed image, the exact imprint of God's person. In other words, Christ is God. From our brief survey of the three phrases recorded, it should be obvious that the complete scriptural record of both Old and New Testaments is revealed in this one verse. The concept of the eternal Logos is not unique to the New Testament. The basic doctrine of the Logos is traceable back to pre-Christian Greece. The Greek speculation on this subject is marked by such names as Herculetus, Aristotle, Plato, and the Stoics. These early Greek philosophers sought to discover a universal law or ruling principle within the chaotic world of change. The law was sometimes called justice sometimes harmony, but more frequently it was called Logos. Plato reasoned that true reality is found in the concept of the divine idea resident within the divine mind before the creation of the world. But the Stoics were the first to develop a systematic exposition of the doctrine of the Logos, and they believed that all things in the universe were subordinate to the rational order of the Logos. Alexandrian philosophy struggled to unite Greek philosophy with the Hebrew religion. Philio, the Jewish commentator of Alexandria, tried to interpret Jewish scriptures by the aid of Greek philosophy, and he wrote much in regards to the Logos. Many Bible theologians have attributed John's concept of the eternal Logos to the writings of Philio. When we see the seeds of Greek philosophy in the Bible, should we reject the belief in divine inspiration? Does the presence of pagan Greek thought change the truth of the New Testament? The Apostle Paul understood 
that the divine law of God is instinctive in the hearts of all men. At times, Greek philosophy touched the truth of divine law written in their hearts. The Apostle John, in verse 3 of his prologue, presented Jesus as the eternal creator. John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This verse indicates that Jesus is the active agent of creation, not a supporting actor. In our limited awareness, We've always seen Christ as Logos, but the complete Godhead is Logos. The New Testament teaches that Christ was and is the creator and the source of all creation. Let's look at three scriptural references. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The second verse in the Amplified Bible, and through him he created the worlds and reaches of space and the ages of time. That is, he made, produced, built, operated and arranged them in order. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 for by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. From this brief New Testament survey, it should be obvious that Jesus Christ is the creator and the guiding force of the universe. The Apostle John, in verse 4 of his prologue, presented Jesus as the eternal life of God. John chapter 1, verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. According to John, the life was in Christ, and this life gave humanity the spark that elevated man above the rest of creation. Some might refer to this spark as the seed of Logos. This scripture also revealed Christ as the life giver from the beginning of creation. Christ was and is the author of life. Through sin, man lost access to the life of God. So Jesus came that through him we might have life and that more abundantly. John also stated that the life of the Logos was to light every man. The light being spoken of is not a simple candle used to enlighten a dark room. The spiritual light found in Christ was manifested and revealed in the truth of his person. The Greek word phos has the application of truth and its knowledge together with spiritual awareness and reason. God breathed life into every man born. That very life became the intelligence of man. Man is the only creature of creation that has the ability to commune with God in spirit. It must be understood, man is the only creature created in the image of God with the power of reason and thinking, but this intelligence must be developed. The Apostle John, in verse 5 of his prologue,
presented Jesus as the eternal light of God. John chapter 1 verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In this verse, we are taught that the light shines in darkness, and the darkness could not blot out the light. The Greek word skoia, that is translated darkness, has a distinctive metaphorical application of the ignorance of divine things and its associated wickedness and misery. Darkness is seen in Scripture as the absence of knowledge. In other words, darkness is ignorance of the things of God. The concept of ignorance is revealed in the Greek word agnostic that interprets as no knowledge. The sad fact is many Christians are agnostic of the things of God, living in spiritual darkness and ignorant to the reality of God. Much of the New Testament deals with Christian darkness. Note the present tense of this phrase, the light shineth, indicating not merely the present point of time, but that the light has gone forth without interruption from the beginning until now, and is still shining. The darkness could not apprehend the light, nor could the darkness of man eclipse or control the light. The word comprehend, used in the King James Version of the Bible, is a mistranslation of the Greek word katalambo, that means to take eagerly or to seize or possess. This word does not have the application of simple misunderstanding, but does indicate that darkness will fight to seize and possess the light of God. Sad to say, secular humanism is only a dogmatic attempt to seize and control the light of God. The Apostle John, in verse 14 of his prologue, presented Jesus as the eternal glory of God. John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In this verse, we see the Word becoming flesh. This is a very thought-provoking statement. Christ is the eternal Word of God, becoming human flesh to redeem man from the control of sin. In becoming flesh, Christ did not cease to be the eternal Word. Christ did not lay aside His divine nature to become flesh. Also, He did not part with the rational soul of man. Since Christ retained all the essential properties of the Word, He entered into a new mode of being, not a new being. The Greek word used in this verse for flesh is sarx, that describes the new mode of being. Sarx signifies the human nature with its frailties and passions. The phrase, becoming flesh, means more than assuming a human body. Christ assumed the entire human nature, identifying himself with the race of man, having a human body, a human soul, and a human spirit. Christ did not clothe himself in flesh, but he became flesh. This very fact is why Jesus can be our high priest and why he knows the feelings of our infirmities. He was tempted in all areas of his nature, and yet he didn't sin. Let's consider the price Jesus paid to become flesh. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. These verses teach that the sacrifice of Christ offered was to fulfill the will of his Father, and that Christ existed before creation in the form of God, with all power, honor, and glory belonging to the Godhead. 
The concept of Christ thinking, it is not robbery to be equal with God, is unclear in its implication. The Greek translation of robbery in this context means a prize, a thing to be grasped. Christ, in his pre-incarnate state, did not think his status in the Godhead was something to be prized at all costs. This scripture is a direct reference to the eternal humility of Christ that motivated him more than his glory and position. The will of his Father was more important to Christ than selfishly grasping his eternal position. Christ's humility was expressed in his obedience to his Father's will. The concept of Christ making himself of no reputation is unclear without examining the Greek word of no reputation. Kino is translated to be empty out, to be poured out. This definition implies that Christ emptied out the qualities of his divine nature, but retained his true divine nature, tabernacled in human form. Christ humbled himself even further and he took upon himself the form of a servant. Christ did not tabernacle with humanity in royal dignity, but he occupied the lowly position of a servant. Matthew 20, 25 through 28 is clear. The kingdom of God is established in righteousness, humility, and a servant attitude. The servant attitude releases the mind and power of Christ in us and through us. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 also clarifies the mission of Christ as it relates to his becoming flesh. The design of God was for Christ to taste death for every man, that he might bring many sons unto glory. The objective of the Incarnation was to bring spiritual perfection and maturity to a defeated and weak human experience, that through Christ we might also overcome the world. Verse 14 of John's prologue also states, that the Word dwelt among humanity, and his believers beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. The Greek word skeno has the application of the erection of a tabernacle. The use of this Greek word is a direct reference to the tabernacle of Moses in the Old Testament. During the Old Testament dispensation, the tabernacle of Moses was a meeting place between God and man. To dwell with humanity as recorded in verse 14, carries the implied reference to the tabernacle of Moses. The New Testament is established on the fact that Jesus Christ is the true tabernacle of God, the total, final, and complete meeting place between Creator and creation. The reference in verse 14 to the glory of Christ is also a direct reference to the Old Testament manifestations of the divine glory in the wilderness in the temple and even to the prophets. The Apostle John, in the final verse of his prologue, presented Jesus as the eternal revealer of God. John chapter 1, verse 18. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. In this verse, we see the declaration that the ministry of Christ is to declare and reveal the Father to fallen humanity. Jesus came to reveal his Father to the fallen human race of men. Each and every one of us is included in this declaration. At first glance, it's hard to accept that Jesus is the true revealer of God in the light of politically correct religious tolerance. For centuries, men have searched and reasoned about the existence of God, but human logic and reason did not bring forth the revelation of Jesus Christ. Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, and many others recorded their reasonings concerning God and their perception of spirit, but none of these men did what Jesus did. Jesus did not come to bring us a new religion about God, but his incarnation was a manifestation of God. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. At first glance, we might think that this statement made by Jesus is arrogant, bigoted, and elitist. Our perception would be true if Jesus was only a religious philosopher. But if Jesus Christ is the true Son of God, then we must consider what he said, because attention to this statement could have eternal consequences. Who is Jesus Christ? This is the question that for nearly 2,000 years, theologians, philosophers, and scientists have sought to answer. Hebrew prophets witnessed his coming from afar, while his own disciples felt the warm beating heart of the Son of God. Even to this day, we still must seek to answer this question, because our answer will have eternal consequences. We see that Jesus Christ is much more than the suffering Messiah who walked the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is the eternal Logos, pure Word of God. He is the Creator, the Life Giver, the bright shining light of God. Simply stated, Jesus is God.